Okay, good evening, everyone. Today also, uh, yes, uh, we are blessed to have a fraud. And uh, in this, uh, as you already saw my email, here we have also some ha hands-on experiences. And again, thank you very much. Based on your feedback, it seems you're enjoying his session. He's very skillful and uh, experienced in his field. I hope you can gain some uh, good uh, knowledge from him and, uh, and just try to mimic his uh, skills. I'm telling you, one of your friends uh, like just got a job in a really good company and based on her feedback, the, the reason that she could get her that job, it was they asked about her experience at college and she had some good experience that she could talk about the project that she did. I think also you can, get some idea uh, how you should uh, do interview with uh, healthcare companies based on what uh, the uh, basic, some hints that the fraud provides for you. Uh, okay, without further ado, just give podium to him and I think uh, uh, just let him to do, uh, continue the presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Hamid. I'm really glad to hear that a lot of folks enjoyed the presentation last time. Nothing gives me greater joy than talking about my work, especially with students at the university where I went to school. So um, let me put this in presentation mode and we'll get started. There we go. Okay, so also I should, there's a like dongle here. Thank you. Perfect. Cool. I'm not going to go through this again, but some, hopefully most of you remember me from about a month ago. If not as well, I work for Optum. Those are my dogs. So learning objectives for today. Uh, I'm going to spend maybe 10 minutes just recapping what we went through last time. Because I know that I gave you a lot of information last time. I basically went over the entire United States healthcare industry in about 45 minutes. So we'll quickly recap that. But the really fun thing today, I think is gonna be exploring some real data sets that the US government actually publishes and uh, makes available for researchers like yourselves to learn more about the healthcare industry and uh, about the state of healthcare in the US. Um, we'll end that with an assignment. So you'll actually walk away from here tonight with an assignment using this data. And then I'll actually be back one last time, I promise, um, in November to kind of see how everybody's done with this. Um, last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about applying and interviewing for jobs in healthcare analytics. As Professor Hamid was saying earlier, like that's obviously everybody's goal, like not necessarily in healthcare, but obviously we all wanna graduate from this program or even before graduating, start looking for employment opportunities, internship opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how to kind of set yourself apart from uh, the whole pool of candidates. Does that sound like a good plan? Um, okay, so let's do a quick recap. Healthcare transactions and population health. You might remember last time uh, I gave you an example of a patient named Sally. Sally who works for the David Clark company gets her healthcare insurance through her employer which is a very, very common way for uh, people in the US to get healthcare. Every, what happens in a healthcare insurance environment is Sally and her company perhaps pay premiums to the health insurance company. And in exchange, the health plan provides coverage to Sally, all right? I'm just gonna quickly recap what she went through. Okay, she went to see her, if you'll remember, she went to see her uh, uh, family health doctor her PCP, primary care physician, uh, for her annual checkup. And she got her annual checkup. There were some abnormalities that the primary care doctor found, right? Like they did the whole checkup and they found that there are some irregularities in her heartbeat. But anyway, the primary care doctor built a claim and got paid for it by the health insurance company because of the cardiology issue. Sally then went to see a cardiologist who then built a claim, got paid for it. Sally went to see another opinion at another group, Evercure Physician Group Cardiology. That doctor built a claim, got paid for it. 
And then that cardiologist actually prescribed some medications to Sally. So Sally went to our local pharmacy, picked up the drugs, the pharmacy billed the claim, got paid for it. And then she had an adverse reaction to one of the medications. So when she started taking the drugs, she actually felt shortness of breath, felt really, really bad, called 911, ambulance came and picked her up, took her to the hospital, ambulance billed the claim, got paid for it. And then she went to the hospital, hospital bill the claim, get paid for it. You get the picture, right? So this is basically a recap of the transactional nature of healthcare. The reason I wanted to recap this is because each part, each node in this picture is a data point, right? Every time a claim is billed and every time a claim is paid, that transaction is recorded, you know, uh, in, within the health plan. And when it's recorded, it becomes a data point. So all of a sudden, you actually have a pretty longitudinal, pretty comprehensive picture of what's happening to Sally. So now multiply this by millions and millions to represent all of the people in this country who are getting care. And all of a sudden you have a massive data set that's telling you who exactly is seeking medical care, what types of medical care they're seeking, what types of providers are providing this medical care, what is Dr. Jones doing, what is Life Saver Ambulance doing, what is Medex Pharmacy doing. You have all of these data points about what is actually happening in our healthcare industry. The other really interesting thing is that every provider that's billing a claim, they don't just get paid you know, for telling the insurance company that, hey, I did a visit for Sally, or hey, I checked her out for cardiology. They actually have to provide diagnosis codes. So in order to get paid by the health plan or by the government, depending on who they're billing, they actually have to tell them what were the diagnosis codes or what were the problems that Sally presented. So for example, when she went for an annual physical with her family health PCP, the PCP noticed there was some kind of an abnormality in the heartbeat. And then she may have also gotten diagnosed for other issues, like maybe she has some anxiety issues. Maybe she has a history of cancer in her family. Maybe she has you know, issues with uh, joint pain. All of those little disorders or little illnesses are actually coded in the claim that's filed with the insurance company. So again, that becomes a really, really rich source of data because every single provider is documenting all of the different conditions that Sally has. So not only are you getting a view of all the transactions that are happening and all the services that she's accessing, but you're also getting a view of what's wrong with Sally. Again, multiply that by millions and millions, and you actually get a pretty oh, view of everything that's wrong with everybody in this country right? Because every doctor in this country is billing conditions and diagnosis codes for every individual that's seeking medical care. And diagnosis codes, there's hundreds of thousands of diagnosis codes. There is a diagnosis code, for example, for being bitten by a shark. There's a diagnosis code for getting injured while dancing. There's a diagnosis code for more, you know, common things like cancer and diabetes and things like that. But there's, you can think of any way that you can ever get hurt, ever get diagnosed with any kind of illness. There's a code for that. And of course, mental health and behavioral health disorders. There's many diagnoses codes dedicated to that. Does that all make sense? Are there any questions? Okay. So we went through this whole cycle. And one thing that's really, really important to remember is the health plan is not always a private insurance company, okay? In a lot of cases, the health plan can be the government because we actually have major programs in the country called Medicare and Medicaid. So in this case, the picture is exactly the same, but instead of all these providers billing the claims and documenting the diagnosis codes to the private insurance company, they're doing it with the government, all right? To recap another thing, if you're gonna think about the share of people in the country, uh, just about 55% of patients get their care or get their insurance through private cover, uh, coverage, about 20% Medicaid, 15% Medicare and military, and 9% is uninsured. A lot of this data is very proprietary. A private insurance company almost never shares information to researchers or the public about what's happening in the population. 
the government, Medicare and Medicaid, are very good about sharing that data, which is what we're, we're going to use today, particularly Medicare. And remember, Medicare is actually a program that's primarily meant for the elderly. Okay, so people who are 65 and older are typically, there are some exceptions, but generally they're the ones who qualify for Medicare coverage. So the data that we're going to play with a little bit later today is actually going to represent that 15% of the population. The military is a fairly small, um, uh, small segment, and that's not going to be covered today. But about 15% of the population, that's the elderly 65 plus population, that's the data we'll be, um, that's, that's the data we'll be using today. One other, maybe two other concepts that I wanted to recap on from last time, we talked a little bit about the, these two pyramids. Not only is this a great visual for how healthcare costs are structured and how they're distributed, but this also gives you an introduction to a couple of really important concepts, polychronic. Does anyone remember what the polychronic term means from last time? Can, can you say that once more? Severe illnesses, the key term there is illnesses. There's many different severe illnesses, okay? Uh, uh, the, the term poly means many. So basically, not only do you have diabetes, but you have diabetes and you have hypertension and you have anxiety and you have depression. That's what we're talking about with polychronic. So people who have multiple chronic disorders only comprise of about 5% of the population, but they make up 45% of medical costs in use, okay? People who have 75% you know, of the population, so three out of every four people are healthy. Individuals with very, very minor health issues or no health issues, they only make up 20% of all medical costs in use. So this pyramid is generally a very, very important concept for us to keep in mind. If you're a policymaker, if you're a CEO of a private insurance company, if you're in the government, this is the type of stuff that you want to think about because this also tells you where the influence lies, right? This was another visual that we looked at. Uh, it's, it's trying to communicate the same information, but this is basically telling us that complex chronic individuals carry eight times the amount of cost as a healthy individual. So two different, two different slides, two different visuals that are trying to communicate the same information. I try to recap this because this is going to be extremely, extremely, extremely important. Not only is this going to be important for our project, but it's also just generally very, very good information to know. If you're ever trying to illustrate during an interview or during a conversation with a policymaker, with a, you know, with a potential hiring manager uh, or a recruiter about how much you know about the healthcare industry, you throw these terms around and it's, it's definitely going to immediately going to click with them that, okay, this person obviously knows what they're talking about. Hey, are you, are we all good? Are there any questions? Okay. Um, at some point, I'll see if I can, um, I don't know if I can open up the chat. I know I see it over there, but I don't actually see it over here, just in case people have questions on the chat. I'll figure that out some more. Um, so we're going to play with some data sets. Um, I want to first start by introducing who it is that's actually providing access to data. The data sets that we're going to work with today is provided by a government agency called CMS. CMS stands for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Pretty self-explanatory what they do. Uh, CMS is an agency under the Department of Health and Human Services. The current Secretary of Health and Human Services is a man named Xavier Bercera. And the current administrator of CMS, her name is Chiquita brooks Lashore. Uh, obviously, these posts just um, uh, evolved about a year ago with the Biden administration coming into power. Uh, the CMS administrator under the Trump administration was a woman named Seema Verma. So Seema Verma has recently um, changed to Chiquita brooks Lashore. This is a very, very high profile, very important position in the government. Um, CMS makes a lot of data publicly available for research. So for this class, we'll focus on two data sets. One of the data sets is, uh, is regarding prevalence of chronic disease by state in the US. The second data set we'll uh, use is per capita healthcare cost and population risk score by county in the US. And then later on, I'll go, go through your assignment. 
I think, uh, Professor, I think you sent a um, email out with the with the information. We'll touch on that in a second. Um, I want to first talk about what is chronic disease. Again, I'm going into this a little bit more repetitively because it's really, really uh, important that we understand this concept. A chronic disorder, by definition, is a disorder that cannot be fixed. A chronic disease has no cure. That's the definition, all right? Examples include all of these. These are all the chronic diseases that are tracked by um, uh, uh, CMF. Stroke, schizophrenia, uh, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, just some examples of diseases that don't necessarily have a cure. It's a chronic illness. You can maintain it, right? You can be very well managed, very well controlled, but there's not necessarily a therapy-based cure for the disease. Um, so if you kind of look at this chart, some things that stand out, um, arthritis, about a, a third of our senior population actually has arthritis, joint disorder, um, we have chronic kidney disease. Uh, chronic kidney disease comes in various different flavors. Some are more severe than others. Uh, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. Um, some of you might know that there's generally speaking an obesity epidemic in this country. And uh, conditions like hyperlipidemia and hypertension are just offshoots of, of that or effects of that. So any thoughts on like, just, just a general kind of brainstorming here, any thoughts on what can you do with data like this? What, what, why, why is this, why is any of this important? Is that one sport? Yeah, absolutely. So if you could break break this down by age, you could say, okay, 30 year olds have a high prevalence of this, 60 year olds have a high prevalence of that. Why? Like tell me a little bit more. Why 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 do I care about that? Okay. Yeah, so that's a, I'll highlight like one specific point you mentioned, which is education, right? Like education in schools. So depending on what are the current issues facing our society, whether that's obesity or alcohol use or whatever, like you can really, from a policy standpoint, you can really focus on, okay, I need to do something differently at the school level, right? Or I need to do something differently in our community centers where all these you know, 70 year olds hang out, right? So that's a, that's a great example of a very tangible thing you can do with this data. Any, any other examples? Someone in the chat. I have no idea how to get to the chat here. Let me, let me see. Um, oh, there we go. Budget allocation to healthcare. Okay, so. Amina knows what she's talking about because uh, that's that's definitely a big, big, big part of why we care about this. Let me move this off to the side here. Ooh. That is a significant reason why we care about this because think about like if you're CMS, if you're the US government, you're actually paying all these claims for all these providers, right? So all the providers that are caring for people like Sally in our example, right? You're the one who's paying the claims. So you need to understand what you're paying for, right? And if you want to reduce the amount that you're paying, or if you want to manage the amount you're paying, you need to understand that in your population, what are the different disorders that are affecting the people so that you understand like how much money to set aside. So you're right on, Amina, with the budget allocation. So two very important uh, use cases, right, with this data that we're going through. Yeah, that's a so that, that's a really really great point. Tell me, tell me, can you tell me a little bit more specifically, like? <laughs> Okay. 
that level of gratification for the customer is there. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect example with another use case, right? Because say you're an insurance company and you, you're in a town where, you know, you have all age groups, let's say, but let's, let's just suppose that in that town, you really don't have a high prevalence of chronic disease. You have like mostly healthy people. There's a lot of places in the Midwest and the Mountain West states of the U.S. where the health is actually very, very high. Uh, but you can then design your benefits, your insurance benefits and the premiums and the deductibles and everything to incentivize people to just stay healthy and not mess up, right? So you can kind of um, set up your premiums and allocate your like, medical expenditures in that way. That's a great example. Um, let's go to the next slide here. All right, so I think most of you have done this already, but I'll just give three minutes for anyone to catch up here. For the next part of the class, you have to actually be using this data. So if you have this pulled up already, please, you don't have to do anything. If you don't have this pulled up, please go ahead and navigate to the site and download the data set and pull up the CSV file. So I'll allow like a couple of minutes for that. Please ask them the chat if you have any questions. Yeah, when you do this, you cannot see, but yeah, for some reason, I can see the chat. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, unfortunately, here it doesn't show anything, so it's nice. that's, that's all right. I don't have, I don't know if it to be a slideshow view. Yeah, but let's see. It is odd. Yeah, it's, yeah, they don't sync well together, I guess. Uh, quite preview. Oh, yeah. I uh, figured it out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, so take, take like 10 more seconds to get uh, settled here. And then yeah, I'm as chat is you can't do anything. Yeah, it just okay. Gets All, right, it'll, 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 it'll. All right, everybody's with me, right? So for this class, we will be very selective about the data that we use. For this class, the data should only be filtered for the following. The Benny Geo level, there's a column called Benny Geo level. It should only be filtered to state. So you want to filter out anything that's not state. I know there's a lot of ways you can do this using a lot of a variety of tools, but for now, just stay in the CSV file. Please filter everything for Benny Geo level state. Benny age level must say 65 plus. In the CMS data set, you actually get multiple options, but please make sure it's filtered towards Benny age level 65 plus. And the Benny demo level has a few options. The ones that we're gonna focus on are either all or race. So basically on the Benny demo level all, it'll give you the information for all races, but if you select race, then you can actually drill into you know, a variety of races. We'll give it like five seconds for everybody to get on the same page there. So just to remind you, And this isn't fake data, like this is actually like real state of healthcare in the US as of 2018. So. Everybody's on the same page? You're good? Oh, yes.
Oh, yes. I can repeat, uh, Rishi. Uh, it's actually on the screen, so Benny Geo level should be filtered to state. So if you look at the first red circle on the left side of my uh, picture here, Benny Geo level must be state. Benny age level must be 65 plus. And Benny demo level can either be all or race. You can just filter it for, for all for now. Uh, later on, you can play around with the race part. All right, I'm going to move on to the next part. All right, so here's a couple of sample questions just to kind of give you a little bit of practice on how to use this data set. Can anyone tell me which state has the highest level of depression among 65 plus seniors? Pretty simple question, put it on the chat if you're on Zoom. Question is which state has the highest level of depression among 65 plus people? Anybody figure it out yet? Again, if you have the, uh, if you're on Zoom, or if you're not in the classroom, then uh, feel free to put your answer in the chat. Sorry? That is not correct. Oh, um, yeah, I think so. I think I think you may be right. It's yeah. So usually all season like the warm weather, so just <laughs> That's a good, it will be a good guess. Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of hints here, okay? Um, we're already filtered for state. There's a lot of states that show up in this call. We're already filtered for the 65 plus seniors. What are you looking for? Is the condition to be depression and you're looking for the highest number under depression. It's not Texas. 
What is the what is the percent you found for depression in Texas? Oh, so we're talking about that's it. I'm glad you said that. We're talking about the highest level of depression. What we're talking about here is prevalence. Okay, so prevalence incidence. Is it West Virginia? Yes. Who 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 was that? Who was talking? Uh, Zoom, Amarildo. Uh, yes. Uh, so you're absolutely correct. West Virginia is the correct answer. Uh, can you can you tell the class about why you think it's West Virginia? Uh, well, just because uh, because of like uh, based on prevalence, so it's a zero point one nine five four for depression, sixty five plus, and I just get like West Virginia. Yeah, and, and 0 0.1954 was the highest number in that table, right? So basically 19.5% yep. of people in West Virginia were diagnosed with depression. It's not, you know, highest by far. You know, there are some other states that might be 19%, 18%, whatever, but West Virginia stands out as the highest one. So great job, Ju, thank you. Um, let me go to, oops, sorry. Let me go to the next question, which is in Massachusetts. So this one is very state specific. In Massachusetts, what is the prevalence of chronic kidney disease amongst Hispanic population? And you're like, just play with the filters, you know, no kind of thorough analysis. I'm not asking for any calculations or analysis or anything like that. Sorry, what was that? So I actually have no idea what it is because I don't remember. I don't remember the one. But t t tell us, tell us how you filtered the table. Uh, the population is very mainstream, and then in the Massachusetts, and then did you filter the race for Hispanic? So. Here, you gotta change the Benny demo level to race. And then out of race, you gotta uh, look for the one that says Hispanic. So 25% is the uh, answer on the board. If anyone has a better answer, shout them out. Uh, 2917. Okay, so 29% is the other answer. So I'll just jump to the key. I do have the screenshot here with the answer. 29.17% is the right answer, again, by the same individual. So um, yeah, again, like simple filter, right? We're in Massachusetts, 65 plus, we just filter for Hispanic, the chronic kidney disease prevalence is 29%. These are just two very simple questions, just to get you a little bit familiar with the data set. Does anyone have any questions about what this data set's trying to tell us? because you're gonna have to do a lot more with this data set, right? These two questions were just to kind of get your toes wet a little bit. Anyone has any questions about what this data set's trying to tell us or how to use it? Do we feel comfortable with how to use this information? Yep. I'm going to give like 10 more seconds and then I'll move on. Okay. So we're moving on from the chronic disease prevalence data. If, if you have questions, we can go back to it, but it is important like with the limited time we have to like make sure that I cover the second data set as well you will have plenty of opportunity to use both of them uh, in, the, in the near future. So understanding per capita cost and risk data. Again, this was in the email that was sent out earlier. If you haven't already downloaded it, please navigate to this website and click on download, keep 2020 selected. Make sure that in the next two minutes, you have this file downloaded and you have the CSV file open in front of you.
Does anybody not have this CSV file open? Just raise, raise your hand if you're not there yet. Everybody's got the CSV file open? Are we good? The per capita cost? Anyone on Zoom still need some more time? All right. So moving on to uh, how we're going to use this data. So for this class, we will only focus on the aged non-dual population. So you'll see some columns that have the term A-G-N-D in the column name. It stands for age non-dual. Uh, so the only columns of interest will be A, B, C, D, E, O, P, Q, okay? So you can either get rid of the other columns, you can hide them, I don't care. But for this class, we will only be focusing on, you know, these, these are obviously like the variables that are describing the data, but in terms of the data values, we're only concerned about column O, column P, column Q. Uh, it's only the columns that have the term A, G, and D in the column name. I'll just give everyone 10 seconds to make sure that we're hiding or getting rid of any columns that we don't want to look at. Are we all there? Good. All right. Um, I want to spend uh, maybe 30 seconds defining what these terms mean. You're really going to need to know this in order to be able to use this data set. Per capita expenditures is, lo is looking at your entire bucket of medical costs divided by the total number of people in your population. So basically the average cost of medical services per person is what per capita expenditure means, all right? Average risk score, this is a really interesting variable. Remember earlier when I was talking about like the diagnosis codes that are billed for Sally and everybody else who seeks medical care? CMS actually uh, attributes a value to each diagnosis. The sicker you are, the higher the score is. So basically in this data set, they report the average amount of sickness a population has. It's all normalized to 1.0. So if you have a state or a county that has a sickness level of 1.0, that means they're pretty average. If you have a state or a county that has 1.2, that means they're very sick. If you have a state or a county that have 0.7 or 0.8, that means they're very healthy. This is a really, really important concept for us to understand, like uh, what the average risk for me. Does that, does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? And then person years is kind of a confusing term. It basically just means people. CMS uses the term person years because sometimes people are not eligible for the entire year, right? Maybe they're eligible just for eight months and then they die, or maybe they're eligible for eight months and they move away, you know, move abroad or anything, right? So there's, there's certain cases where like a person may not be eligible for the entire year. It may be a partial person. That's what that's why they call it person years, but it's just a fancy term for number of people. So again, per capita expenditures is average medical cost per person. Risk score represents the amount of illness burden in your population. Person years means people. Questions? Are you ready to answer a couple of questions about this data? Sample question. I'm focused on Massachusetts right now, okay? You're gonna get this exact same view if you filter for Massachusetts. Nothing, there's nothing mysterious about this. Which county has higher cost? Berkshire County or Bristol County? Again, we're wondering whether Berkshire County or Bristol County has higher cost.
Bristol. So Bristol, does anyone think it's not Bristol? And pl please explain uh, why why you think it's Bristol. Well, so you you said like uh, which one has like the most expensive one? So per capita, it says uh, ten thousand two hundred and six for Bristol and nine thousand three hundred and forty seven for uh, Berkshire. Thank you for that. And did you is that the same explanation for you? Okay. Does anyone think it's not Bristol? So this is actually kind of a trick question. Um, per capita, Bristol does have does appear to have higher costs than Berkshire. Can you can you think of any reason why the answer may still be Berkshire? Uh, is it because of the I mean person per year, so it has more. That's why. So that's a good guess, but actually Berkshire has a smaller population as well. Okay. So either way, Bristol has more dollars and more people and, and high per capita, but that's a good guess. We have another hand in the class. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Any other any other reason why Berkshire might actually have higher costs? We've already covered the per capita cost and the person years is not the answer. So there's only one other variable left, right? I mean, it's the risk, but for Berkshire, it's lower than the Bristol, so. Yeah, that's exactly it. So did, did everyone catch that? This is a really, you're really, really hint. You're really, really going to need this concept in order to succeed in the assignment, right? So if you look at the per capita cost as is, Bristol obviously appears to have, you know, much higher costs than Berkshire, right? But what's really happening here, all right, is that Berkshire actually has a much healthier population than Bristol. Bristol has a much sicker population because remember, average risk score is normalized to 1.0. So if you're south of 1.0, you're healthier. If you're north of 1.0, you're sicker. So you can't really compare Berkshire and Bristol because it's like comparing apples and pineapples, all right? So if you're gonna answer that question, you gotta do a little bit of math. The risk normalized per capita cost is literally the per capita cost divided by your average risk score, okay? You're just normalizing to 1.0 risk score. It's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything like super complicated, it's just, this column divided by that column. And if you do that, all of a sudden, the picture completely changes, right? Berkshire now has $9,900 of cost. Bristol has $9,700 of cost. So really, really, really important to recognize that, all right? I'll give you a more radical example of this. Say, what's, what's your name? Can you, can you spell it for me? I don't which area? Okay. So say which area? And Ifrat were two doctors, all right? He had 100 patients in his panel. I have another 100 patients. His cost, uh, the, the cost of patients that he cares for was $10,000. The cost of patients that I care for is zero. It's a really, really drastic example. Does that mean he's any better or worse than I am? For all you know, the 100 patients that he cares for all have really, really complicated cancer. The 100 patients that I care for are all 18 year olds who don't need any medical care. Apples and pineapples, right? you can't compare that. So anytime you're in a comparative scenario where you're comparing costs, you always have to think about what are we comparing? So risk is a really, really important factor. Um, and then Rishi, I see a question from you. You're asking how to calculate the risk normalized per capita cost. That's actually really, really simple, thankfully. You just take the per capita cost divided by the average risk score. That's, that's by definition, what you're doing is you're normalizing to 1.0 risk score. There's another sample question. I'm gonna move on. Uh, 
Okay. Um, the next sample question I have is which county? So now I'm not talking about Berkshire versus Bristol, right? I'm talking about all counties. Which county has the highest per capita cost after adjusting for risk? Once again, there's one really obvious answer here. It's right on the board. And there's one like slightly less obvious answer. So it's Berkshire, I think. Uh, tell me more, why do you think it's Berkshire? Well, because it's like 93.47 and 93, I mean, 0.936. So that could be like around $93. I don't have a calculator here. That's why I'm just. <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the thankfully, the risk normalized per capita cost is right on the screen. So Berkshire County has a risk normalized cost of 99.85, right? Yep. Um, so you can kind of use that and calibrate yourself against that number and tell me, what do you think is the highest uh, cost in the county? Any takers here? Who is the highest risk adjusted per capita cost? What is the highest number in this column? Yeah, 12,000, right? And, and, and it corresponds to, if I trace it back, it corresponds to Duke County. And what is the high, second highest number in this column? And that corresponds to Nantucket. Does anybody, does anyone know here like where Nantucket is or what Nantucket is? Um, it's, it's an island. Does anyone know what Dukes County is? Dukes County is also an island, right? So Nantucket and Dukes, which are two of the most expensive counties in Massachusetts, are both tiny islands. One of them has 1,000 people and the other one has 3,000 people. That's why I was saying that there's one really obvious answer to this question, right? Because the question I asked was literally, what's the highest number in this column, right? Really, really simple, right? But the answer is a little bit more complicated than that. It's not wrong to say that Dukes and Nantucket are the highest cost, but you have to also think about the context. You may not know like these counties are islands, but if you look at the person years, the number of people, you'll quickly notice that some of these places and a lot of rural counties in the United States have very, very small populations. Some of them, like Suffolk County, where Boston is, has 28,000 seniors. And some of them have 1,000 people. So when looking at the county level information, when comparing one county to another, statistical validity is also really, really important. I know you've been studying that a lot in this class and in other classes in your programs. So when you look at the entire array of counties across the US and you're comparing across the US, really think about statistical validity and how do you make sure that you don't put too much emphasis or too much importance as a policymaker on a tiny island that has 1,000 people. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think so. So in, in order to truly answer, my, you're exactly right. In order to truly answer my question, you probably have to like uh, place some kind of a statistical corridor in your analysis, which we're not gonna do here, right? But you're probably gonna have to like, place some sort of corridor as to what you perceive as valid, and then you need to answer that. You're like, so I guess you have no benefits. So you can't, you can't yeah. On the map, so you can't show that that's a good thing and also you can't, Keep my whole population and just show people what's going on. So from there, might be much harder. Exactly. Yeah. And and some statistical software, you can actually use built-in algorithms to figure out like, okay, in a in a population or in a data set that this large, what is the what are the you know outer ends of the spectrum that you can kind of eliminate or somehow treat differently or normalize. Um, okay, so any questions on the chronic disease data set or the per capita count, uh, per, uh, county level per capita cost data set? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Person years is just, I know it's a little confusing term. It's just a fancy term for number of people. Yeah, this is a number of people. So Worcester County, where we live, there's 49,000 people who are 65 and older. Boston, in Suffolk County, where Boston is, is 28,000 and so on. Other questions about the chronic disease data set or the per capita cost data set? I'm gonna, again, this is super, super important, right? So I'm gonna go up a little bit. Does this all make sense? Was anyone not able to figure out how to get these answers? So all of your ex experts. So let's go on to the assignment. So this is a data visualization assignment. So in this assignment, you're basically going to assume that you're an intern in CMS, and you have the opportunity to present at a meeting with Ms. Chiquita brooks Shore, who is the administrator of CMS. Um, she's a very busy woman, so she can only give you one minute. All right. So the assignment is to create a data visualization product using your tool of choice. The purpose and focus of your story can be very flexible. As you, as you know from these data sets, like it's, it's a vast data set with a lot of information. It's totally up to you what you want to present on or what kind of story you want to create. However, your product must have a concise message or guidance about how your product should be used, right? Take the, some of the examples you talked about with the insurance benefit plan design, education in schools. You know, someone else talked about like budget allocation. Your message could be anything, but it needs to be concise, all right? So because there's, you know, millions and millions of use cases for data like this. Um, some rules, you can either work individually or in groups of two. If your first name starts with A through M, then you have to use the, uh, the chronic disease prevalence data set. If your first name starts with N through Z, use the per capita cost data set. If you're working in a pair, just pick whose name, first name you wanna use and then choose your data set that way. It really doesn't matter all that much. As long as you know there's a fair number of people in the class that use uh, the chronic disease data set, and there's a fair number that uses the cost data set. So I, again, I will come back in November so what Professor Ahmed and I will look for is that each individual and group will have exactly one minute. Maybe we'll give one minute and 30 seconds if Ms. Chiquita feels generous with her time, right? To present your visualization and your message, right? And in terms of what tool you use to present, uh, create your product, how you choose to visualize, I have zero parameters because as the administrator of CMS, she doesn't think about stuff like that. So any questions about the assignment? We'll make sure, I forget the dates here, but we'll make sure you have at least like three or four weeks to work on this. Does that sound yeah. reasonable? Yeah. Oh. Wait for like maybe five more seconds for questions if anyone wants to put it in the chat. Okay. So the last topic, I'll probably spend like five minutes on this. The last topic is probably the most important one that you care about, right? Like you probably care about this way more than you care about like data sets and healthcare and whatnot. So applying and interviewing for jobs in healthcare analytics. Some of you may be interested in this. Some of you may not be. And by the way, some of you may be interested in working in the healthcare analytics field in the US. Some of you may be interested in working in that same space elsewhere, which is fine. But I wanted to leave everyone here with some helpful tips and advice. Um, I also like before this before this class, I just pulled up some real job applications that are out there, some job openings that are open right now. If anyone is uh, interested in applying, I'll, I'll show you there. So first and foremost, I want to give you a couple of common position titles that may apply to you. A lot of people don't talk about this. So when you're kind of out searching online or at job fairs, recruitment fairs and things like that, some common position titles that you wanna look for is things like business analyst, population health analyst, financial analyst, healthcare economics, that's my field, medical economics. Those are some 
titles that you may be you may want to look out for. Again, I'll, I'll repeat them. If you want to take note, business analyst, population health analyst, financial analyst, um, uh, healthcare economics or medical economics. For entry level, like graduate level positions, those are typically the positions that will apply most to you. Um, let me talk about some sample jobs. Again, these are, I'm going to show you three job postings that are out right now. At this moment, they're available. They're currently looking based on the labor market. They're probably having a hard time recruiting. So any application would be very appreciated by them. They'll probably look at it. Um, this is a group. This is a healthcare company that's based in Worcester, downtown Worcester, right next to City Hall. Um, they have practices all over central Massachusetts, but their headquarters are right here in Worcester. Um, they're recruiting for a financial analyst and business analyst. They actually have three different positions open for someone like yourself. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but just to kind of give you a flavor of the qualifications, they're looking for a bachelor's degree in finance, accounting, and related, and, and either three to five years experience or some kind of a master's degree. Okay. They say MBA, but they'll value like the um, business analytics degree a lot more. Um, demonstrated ability to develop and present creative approaches and solutions to financial business analysis. Knowledge of accounting principles, et cetera. Basic understanding of income statement. Computer skills, I think you all have that. Excellent organizational interpersonal ability to multitask. This is a really, really common job description. There are thousands of these out there. Yeah, thousands. Many of them are out there in cities and towns across the U.S. where there's a lot, a lot, a lot of competition. And many of them are available in places like Worcester where the competition is a little bit lower and everybody has a better chance. That's how I got my job in Worcester. I'm a fairly intelligent person, but not as intelligent to compete with, you know, graduates in Boston or New York. So. Uh, this is where I got my stuff for that reason. So again, these, this job description is available out there right now. You can go and look for Reliant Medical Group. Apply tonight if you want, um, depending on when you graduate, I guess. I'll give you a couple of other uh, samples. Right? Tufts Health Plan. This is not in Worcester. This is in Watertown, Massachusetts. Big private insurance company. Loves, loves people with healthcare analytics experience or any kind of education around healthcare. Very small font, but I can tell you right now that the requirements are very similar to what the Reliant requirements were. Bachelor's degree with quantitative focus, master's degree with quantitative focus preferred. It's like, it's like this job description is written for you, right? Um, Zero to two years experience in using analytical tools to query, manipulate, and analyze healthcare data. It's literally what you're doing today. Again, this position is open for anyone to apply, right? They're probably having a hard time recruiting people. Um, and by the way, a lot of these positions may actually be remote. Or they'll be, typically speaking, with the healthcare administration fields, they tend to be very flexible. Third, uh, uh, third and final sample I'll show you. And there's millions of these out there, okay? I'm just showing you some samples. Optum itself is a technology development internship. Um, there's internships all throughout the year, but their summer internship program is the most popular. Uh, you must be currently pursuing a master's degree or a bachelor's degree in order to qualify for this internship. Um, anything, you know, they really prefer uh, proficiency and core programming con concepts in at least one programming language like Python, Java, C, SQL, .NET. Optum is a massive company. Uh, it's owned by United Health Group. This is the company that I work for. And um, as a result, they get a lot of applications. It's not a local company. It's based in Minnesota. It's all over the country. They get a lot of applications. Very, very, very competitive. But I wanted to show you a little bit of both. You got the Reliant, which is a Worcester-based company. You got Tufts, which is a Massachusetts state-based company. And then you have Optum, which is a monster in the market. All right, so just a few applications and job uh, uh, descriptions, just to kind of get your minds thinking about what types of opportunities are available. Any questions? Anything that stand out as weird, confusing? 
And then the last thing I'll talk about is uh, I mentioned last time that uh, many of you, as you're graduating from school, you're not necessarily going to be trying to enter in the workforce with a lot of experience behind your backs, right? Many of you will not have any internship experience. Some of you might, which is awesome. Many of you may not have a lot of work experience. Many of you may just be graduating and then looking for a job, right? So there's not a lot of things that you can pull from. You know, when you're sitting down at the interview or when you're talking to the recruiter, there's not a lot of things that you can talk about, right? Because you haven't had that experience. When you don't have a lot of experience, you got to be creative about what you talk about. So even talking about a class you took that one semester where you really liked X, Y, Z is a really valuable anecdote versus no anecdote at all, right? Something like this experience is almost as good as talking about an internship experience, right? Because this is like real job skills. Uh, and not, I'm not just talking about like my uh, presentation or anything. Like this entire class is like basically practical job skills. You can talk about any project in this class and it will go miles in your interview. Um, yeah, does the person you're talking about at the beginning of the class? Is that right? No, it's oh, it's a different. Yeah, so she got a good job in KPMG and they asked about their extension. In that one, and she had a project with fidelity data, so it was a finance company. I'm just telling that one of their friends already got the job and they left the same day. Yeah. Like, it's, I mean, it's, it's the formula, right? The formula is that recruiter is looking for specific experiences. And if you're able to demonstrate that you can do the work, and if you have those experiences, you stick out on their minds. So how do you talk about this experience? You know, you barely know who I am, so I just wanted to kind of give you that information, right? You can talk about a director of healthcare economics from Optum or United Health Group came and talked to your class. That's how you talk about this experience. When you talk about this experience, make sure you mention things like, I work with CMS data sets. CMS is a key term there. You want to also mention the specific types of data sets that you work with. Remember, we're talking about two things, chronic disease prevalence and per capita cost by county. So national healthcare data that talks about chronic disease prevalence and per capita cost by county in the United States among 65 plus year old seniors, all right? You may end up doing a project or your assignment on only one or the other, but you can talk about both data sets because it's part of your experience. So again, if uh, like you don't even have to mention my name, no one knows me, but direct, Director of Healthcare Economics at Optum or United is a, a, a presenter and CMS data sets on chronic disease prevalence and per capita cost. Those are some of the ways that you can talk about it. Of course, depending on what you're gonna do over the next few weeks with the visualization, really kind of pump that up, right? I use these data sets, put them through Tableau, produce this, presented this, one minute, 30 second presentation on XYZ. Those are the kinds of things that really, really, really stick out in recruit response. Does that make sense? That Do you feel like you have the right tools, the verbiage, the vocabulary to talk about this at an interview? Some of the, some of the things like uh, the word, the term chronic disease, or even if you can give examples of like depression, hypertension, uh, uh, diabetes, COPD, they can really kind of set you apart from other candidates because not every candidate is a good interviewer. Many candidates have job experience, but not every, every candidate is a good interviewer. So you can really use that to kind of set yourself apart. Um, any other questions, thoughts for me before, before I take off? So you guys, uh, you mentioned your project from healthcare CMA, which is what you're happy with. So I think you already have knowledge of using mine and Tableau. So if you want to change the data, so later on, if you want, especially if you want to work in a healthcare industry, so it might be much, much better if you do a project but on the like, real case data with healthcare shares. You see more than both of them can change your topic, and if you want to stop with such specific then you don't do anything. That's awesome. That's a good opportunity to like, yeah, use the use the real data set. Yeah, so let me mean you have some more need on your case on your uh, specific 
So, as a next step, then we'll come back sometime in November, and I really look forward to seeing everyone's presentations. Definitely, I try to try to demonstrate to us not only your technical skills, but the fact that you understand the data, that you can tell a story with the data. Um, there's a lot of untapped opportunity in the healthcare space in general. Um, who knows? Something you find or some observation you make can actually become the next project that the healthcare industry works on, right? So be innovative, be creative. Do let us know if you have any questions in the meantime about the data. Anything else before we close? All right, well, I thank you again for your, uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed both the last session and this session. I hope this helpful. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again in November, right? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, those are very sure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Next so, time in the, maybe in November, we can yeah, have together. a discussion at the end of the best time that works for you. Sorry? Let's have a discussion later like, yeah, with the time that works oh, better yeah, yeah. for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, depending on the syllabus and everything, like, yeah. anytime in November, really, but we can email. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm telling you, you can talk with Kirti. He's graduating this semester. So for one of her course that she had with me, so she uh, worked in a project with a uh, uh, fidelity company that's a very large like f company that uh, doing a lot in, uh, they're big in finance. And in the, her interview, she basically, they basically asked her what the project, what you did, how was your involvement? So she asked, so she, she's a really good presenter. So you can talk with her KPM and, I'm pretty sure she competed with people from MIT, Harvard, Cornell, and she got the job. So just yeah. hopefully next time, I mean, I, this is too much soon, but later maybe I, for the next round of the class, uh, not this semester, I might invite her, but she's a still a student and you can talk with her and get some insights. Anything. So any questions about your projects, assignments, or today? So if there's no question over today, that's for today. So from next session, uh, we come back to more hands-on experiences. Also, hopefully if I have time, I add Power BI, but if you are interviewing right now, just go to the LinkedIn and Power BI is much easier than Tableau. So just take a, just a quick uh, certification. It might take like five hours, but you add in your LinkedIn profile and people know it. Yeah, you have that excuse. Hopefully we have time to cover it, but it's still I need to cover more in nine because most of you do project in nine. So I need to spend more time on nine, but anyway. So do your best. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Professor.